Good evening and welcome to December. It's uh, December 1st as we're taping this on Wednesday morning. Welcome to this Bible study. Thank you for joining with us, whether you're watching on Wednesday evening or any other day of the week that you choose to watch. Thank you for taking time to do that. And we, uh, we are thankful that you're a part of what we're doing here this morning. Thank you all for being here. Hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. Hope you had a nice Thanksgiving and uh, looking forward to the holiday season that is now before us. We're going to be in the 23rd Psalm again this morning. If you want to take your Bible and find that, it's such a familiar passage, you probably don't even need a copy of Scripture. You can probably quote it from memory, but it's always good to have it, and sometimes the Holy Spirit kind of whispers something to your heart, and you want to jot a note down, something that helps you remember something later. I always find that helpful to do. My Bible is just, well, Bibles. I have dozens of them, and I just pick up different ones at different times. And uh, they all are just filled with notes in all of the margins and columns. And so uh, it's always good to have God's Word handy with you. You know, in saying that, uh, I, I often say to the young people especially, I don't think this group I need to say this to necessarily, but uh, today it's become very popular for people to use electronic um, Bibles. They use their phone or an iPad or something like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Those are great tools. And I often use those when I don't have anything else with me as well. But there is something about having God's Word in your hand. This is the Bible. And you know, I'll say to parents, you could be sitting in your chair in the morning and your children come through and you've got your phone or your iPad and they don't know if you're reading the news or watching a video or playing a game. They don't know what you're doing. But if you're holding this in your hand, there's only one thing that you're doing with this. This is God's Word and they know that. And just, just using the actual hard copy of God's Word, I think it, it, there's something special special about that. So I'm not being negative about the other things. I'm thankful for modern technology that we have, but uh, I love having uh, the hard copy itself. So we'll be turning to the 23rd Psalm here in just a moment. I don't know how I got off on that, but I did. So uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for the day that we have and for the opportunity that we have today to uh, gather, uh, whether it's this morning with this group or the group this evening that will gather. Thank you that we have this opportunity and that the body of Christ can come together and I thank you for those that are able to join us through technology, those that can't be here. Some live other places. Uh, probably right now there's some people watching over in Arkansas or down in Alabama, maybe in Florida, someone out in Arizona. We have people all over the country that watch our services. And thank you that the church can gather even this way uh, for a Bible study like this. And Lord, we come to you and we pray for uh, needs. I've shared some prayer requests with this group this morning and for all of those that we mentioned, those that have lost loved ones, those that are dealing with difficulties and uh, hard times, I ask you to bless them. And Lord, we pray, as the Bible tells us, we pray for our leaders and we pray for our nation. We pray for those that protect us, for our military and those that serve uh, for freedom's sake, Lord, I pray your blessings upon them. Lord, we're moving into the greatest time of the year. We have an opportunity to, to, just in saying two simple words, we have an opportunity to remind people that this is about the birth of Jesus. Every time we say Merry Christmas, it's a reminder that this is about the birth of Christ the baby of the manger who came into this world who, to pay the price for our sin. May we use this month as an opportunity in every way that we can through a Christmas card, through a spoken word, through an invitation to someone to come to something at our church, whatever it might be, may we use every opportunity we have to point people to Christ, to remind them that this is what Christmas is really all about. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your word that you give to us that gives truth and encouragement. And I pray that you would use this passage to encourage us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's read the passage again. You know it so well, you probably don't have to look at it as I'm reading it. But uh, this is one of those passages, you know, when you learn it as a, as a boy or a girl, for most of us, we learned this when we were children. Uh, most of us learned it in the King James language in, in that um, version. 
And I find myself, as I'm reading it in, in the translation that I always use, the Holman Christian Standard, I find myself wanting to say it the way that I learned it. And uh, there, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But I'll, I'll read it the way that it's written here. And, of course, you know the way, that, um, the way that you learned it originally. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. You know, there's several places there that, and we'll talk about this as we get to it as we go through this chapter, but there's several places that I just think the, uh, the, the, the way that I learned this originally is not maybe only more beautiful, but I think it's probably more accurate. For example, that last phrase, I will dwell in the house of the Lord for as long as I live. When we hear that phrase, we tend to think as long as I live here on earth, as long as I'm breathing and have life and breath. Well, that's not what it says. Jesus said that if a man believes in him or a woman believes in him, they'll never die. And he, Jesus said, and whoever dies in this life will live again. And then he asked the question to Mary and Martha, to whom he was speaking, do you believe this? And so... You and I read that as long as I live and we think about here on earth, but the reality is it's not talking about as long as we live in these physical bodies. It's talking about as long as we live and we're going to live forever. And that original translation of that, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, that's, that's the accurate, that's what he's saying, forever and ever and ever and ever. It's a, that's a beautiful word, and I have jumped way ahead in the passage. Uh, we're, we're on verse 2 tonight, so let's, or this morning, let's go back to the passage and see what it says. We've already discussed last time, the Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing I lack, or I have everything that I need, or he meets all of my needs, however you want to interpret that. But then look at the next phrase. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He lets me lie down in green pastures. Now, let me describe to you a pandemic that's going on in our culture. And I'm not talking about COVID-19. This is a pandemic that's been going on for centuries, through generations. This is a pandemic that has spread across every continent, every uh, race of people, every tribe of people, every... Um, every civilization has experienced what I'm about to describe to you. I'll put it in terms of our own culture. This is a pandemic that affects 70 million Americans. It causes, according to physicians, it causes 38,000 deaths every year. It affects every age group. Teenagers say that this causes them to be affected in their schoolwork. It causes them to be less productive. It cost billions of dollars in lost productivity in our culture every day. Production is lost because of this issue, this problem. Uh, we're told by people who study these things that the, the greatest period of time age-wise for this risk is between when a person is 30 years old and when they are 40 years old. That decade of the 30s, this problem is the most prominent, but it affects every age group. And those who study it say that the age for most of us in this room right now, those who are over 65, that half of all Americans 65 and over suffer from this problem. Now, if I described all of that to, to you and told you the, that's the, those are the results of the issue, what would you think the problem is? What would you think this pandemic is that I'm talking about? Is it drug abuse? Is it alcohol abuse? Is it long-winded preachers? What is this problem that is causing all of this lost productivity and, and, and all of these issues of our society? Well, the, the problem is insomnia. The, the problem is the lack of rest the ability to rest in our world. And, and it, it's almost as though our technology and all of the advances that we have through the years have made the problem worse. 
There was a time when I could disconnect, you know, uh, turn off the lights when I left the office and go home and, and I could be at home. When my kids were little, I could play with the kids. I could do what dads do and husbands do and go home and pick up work the next morning. But then cell phones came along. And along with cell phones came this new thing called the internet and technology that allows work to literally be with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so whatever email I get at my desk now rings to my phone. I get it as though I'm sitting at my desk or a text or a, a phone. I not only get cell phone calls, but if my desk phone, I hate this, I hate this. If my desk phone rings, it rings to my cell phone. So wherever I am, I'm connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now that's not just me, that's just the world in which we live. That's, that's the, the downside of modern technology and the result of that is that we've lost the ability to truly disconnect and rest. Have you ever thought about how many times the Bible talks about the importance of resting? God made us in a way that we need these cycles and we need rest and when we don't get it, there's a problem. Now, we talked last week, or not last week, but the last time we were together studying this, we talked about how significant it was that the Lord used sheep as an example. Now, David was a shepherd. David wrote this. David spent his life, before he became king, at least, he spent his life caring for sheep. He understood the sheep and he understood the work of the shepherd. And so now it's, it, it makes sense that David uses that as an illustration of our relationship to God. And now we are the sheep. David is the sheep. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the sheep. The Lord is the shepherd. He uses this as an example. And, and one of the first things he talks about, he says, the Lord is my shepherd, not the shepherd, not a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. And the first thing he talks about is rest. He lets me, and, and different translations say different things. You could say he makes me. You could say he allows me. You could say that he provides in a way that I am able to rest. That's really the, the gist of the word there. We are able to rest because of what the shepherd does for us. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. People who farm sheep say that there are four things that are necessary for a sheep to rest. And I think that this is intentional. I don't think it's just accidental that the Lord used these things. The Lord knew about sheep. I'll show you a passage in a minute that kind of deals with that. But let me tell you four things that, that sheep farmers say that have to happen in order for sheep to be able to rest. Now you think about, you see, you see cows laying down on the ground, uh, occasionally you see horses, not, not always. Horses will stand up and rest and sleep. But sheep, you more seldom see actually laying down. Things have to be right for them to actually lay down to rest. Now, like a horse, they can rest in some essence standing up, but they also do need to lay down. But there are four things that are necessary in order for that to happen. Here's the first one. They have to be free from any kind of fear. They, they can't have anything, any outside thing, a, a varmint, a coyote, a wolf in, in biblical days. There couldn't be any threat. If there was a threat in the area, if they were hearing those noises, if they were smelling something that let them know that there was a, a, a predator around, they would not lay down and thus they would not be able to rest. Now, what was it that gave them this uh, ability to not be afraid? It was the presence of the shepherd. You know, it was not only the shepherd, but the shepherd would have a sheep dog often. And I think we think in terms of a sheep dog being there to herd the sheep. You know, that the sheep dog is, kind of becomes the the tool that the shepherd uses to corral the sheep and get them where he wants them to be. And there is that element of that. That is indeed true. But the sheepdog is also there for the benefit of the sheep. The sheepdog is there to protect the sheep. The sheepdog, even when the shepherd himself might have had to go do something else, the sheepdog himself is keeping watch over that flock. And if something happens, it's the sheepdog that's going to tell the shepherd that something's going on. It's the presence there of the shepherd 
that's going to give those sheep the ability to rest and to know that someone is watching out for them and someone is protecting them. So David said, the Lord is my shepherd. All these fears, you know, all these things that keep us awake at night. We all deal with sleepless nights. Sometimes, sometimes it's something you ate. Sometimes it's you, you had a cup of coffee or a glass of tea, caffeine, something too close to bedtime, and that keeps you awake. I, I tried to get off caffeine one time because I wanted to see what it would do if I didn't have any caffeine, so I stopped drinking anything with caffeine in it. And I discovered that my wife says that, uh, that I am asleep before my head hits the pillow. And I think she's probably right. I don't have trouble going to sleep. I discovered that the difference between me having caffeine and not having caffeine is probably about two seconds. If I've got caffeine in my system, it might take me two seconds to go to sleep where otherwise I'm just immediately asleep. I don't have trouble going to sleep, but here's my trouble. When I wake up during the night, I'm at an age where that happens. When I wake up during the night, I have to start telling myself, don't start thinking, don't start thinking, don't start thinking. And I do what I need to do and go to the bathroom and try to get back in bed telling myself intentionally, don't start thinking. Because when we start thinking, we get our focus on those things around us, those periphery things that occupy our minds. For years, Saturday has been my worst night of sleep. And I would lay in bed, I would usually wake up 2.30, 3 o'clock the first time and I would flop around in bed and keep my wife awake and just be miserable until I'd finally get on up and uh, uh, three or four or five years ago, I just quit fighting it. I just decided when I wake up for the first time, I'm just gonna go ahead and get up and I go on to work and I'll be more productive at work than I will be here flopping around in the bed, keeping her awake. And it's unusual now on Sunday morning if at 3, 30, 4 o'clock that I'm not here I'd rather be here and getting something done and I'll catch a nap after church is over with. What happens though is we get focused on something. We get focused on something that's concerned us, something that might be upsetting, something that we know we need to do. The sheep found comfort in the presence of the shepherd that allowed them to rest. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord helps us get our mind off those things that cause us fear. Second thing is not only fear, but um, a sheep has to be free from the, I, I don't know exactly the way to say this, but um, the jostling of the herd. Now in the animal kingdom, this is true in, all, in virtually any type of animals. Uh, we, we talk about the pecking order. You know, dogs do this, for example. You can have a little dog chihuahua, little poodle, little bitty dog, and you can get a new dog, a puppy, a big dog, a Labrador, a collie, a big dog. And it's the little dog that's controlling things. It's the little dog who tells the big dog what the big dog can do. And the big dog understands this pecking order. The big dog kind of cowers to the little dog because the little dog rules the roost. It's, it's the pecking order. The pecking order itself comes from the barnyard. Chickens have a pecking order. Uh, cattle farmers, I'm married into a family of cattle farmers, and they call it the horning order, the horns of the cows. And the, the, the older cows or the stronger cows push the other cows out of the way. When you drop the pellets during the winter time, they graze during the summer time, but during the winter time when they drop the pellets, they'll drive the truck through the field, dropping the pellets along the way, and the younger cows may be swifter and get there first, but when big cow or older cow gets there, little cow's getting out of the way. It's the pecking order, right? Well, in sheep, it's called the horning order because of the horns of the sheep or the, uh, the, the goats. And, and they would butt each other out of the way. Now, let me show you something. This is kind of interesting. Hold your place there in, in uh, Psalm. Go with me over to uh, Ezekiel. And there's a passage over there. You don't even have to look at it if you don't, don't want to. I'll just read it to you. This is the 34th chapter of Ezekiel. And I'm starting in verse 15. Uh, Ezekiel 34, 15. 
It says, I will tend my flock and let them lie down. You hear that? I will tend my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, and strengthen the weak. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them with justice. Skip over to verse 20. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says to them. See, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Since you have pushed with flank and shoulder and butted all the weak ones with your horns until you scattered them all over, I will save my flock and they will no longer be prey for you. I will judge between one sheep and another. That's a picture of what, the, of what David is talking about. The, the sheep can't rest if there is this budding and, and pushing going on within the herd. One can't rest if this is taking place around them. And what keeps that from happening? It's the presence of the shepherd. When the shepherd is there, all of this jostling stops and the sheep can rest. So here's the third thing. I said there were four things that are necessary for the sheep to rest. One is the absence of fear. One is the absence of this jostling within the herd. The third one is the absence of insects or uh, pests that would keep the sheep from being able to rest. Now you've seen horses and you've seen cows and they have these flies that get all over them. They get in their ears and a, a, a horse will twitch his ears. God gave a, a horse and a cow a long tail that they're able to flop around and they'll knock those flies off of themselves. You've seen a dog that takes his leg and he, he scratches himself to get something off or a cat, but a sheep's not able to do that. Sheep doesn't have a long tail. Sheep's not able to take that foot and scratch themselves that way. They are really at the mercy of the shepherd. And those flies will get in their ears and their eyes and their nose around their mouth and they just become so miserable that they cannot rest. And so the shepherd, in, in biblical times, what David was talking about, the shepherd would take plants, uh, uh, different ointments that they would get oils even. When we come to the passage later, it's going to say, Thou anointest my head with oil. What's he talking about? Well, this is what he's talking about. The, the shepherd would go to great expense and a great effort to, to put some kind of ointment on each of those sheep to keep those pests away so that the sheep could rest. What was it that allowed the sheep to rest? It was the shepherd. Well, the fourth thing is not only free from fear, free from the budding and jostling within the herd, free from the pest and the things that would uh, keep them from resting, but also free from hunger. They have to be free from hunger. Now, did you notice, look at the, look at the phrase again there in verse two. He maketh me or allows me or lets me lie down in green pastures. Underline the word green, green. How many of you, out of curiosity, how many of you have been to Israel? Raise your hand if you've been to Israel. I see several hands. Okay, now think in your mind about southern Israel, around Jerusalem, um, Bethlehem, Jericho, um, the, the land of the Philistines, southern. Now, when you think about Galilee, when you think about the, Jer uh, the Jordan River Valley, Jezreel Valley, you think green, you think luscious, you think beautiful. It is incredibly beautiful. But when you're in Judea, which is where this was, you don't think green, do you? You're thinking brown. You're thinking rocks. You can't take a step without stepping on a rock. So when there was a green field, do you see that word green? He makes me, lets me, allows me, provides for me to lie down in green pastures. When you see a green field in Judea, that means that somebody, that didn't just happen. Somebody got all those rocks out of that field. Somebody got all that underbrush out of that field. Somebody planted some seeds. Somebody put some water on that field. Somebody made that green field happen. It did not just get there by itself. Who did that? The shepherd. Look at these first few verses here. Let, let me read it and you see if you hear a word that keeps getting repeated. The Lord is my shepherd, there's nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right path. What word did I repeat several times? He, he. This is about the shepherd. It's the shepherd who gives us our rest. Now what we've got to learn to do is focus on the, on the shepherd. Because when we focus on, on the problems around us, that's what happens when I wake up at night. 
and I start thinking about everything that's going on around me, I get my mind on the wrong things and, and I can no longer rest. If we can learn to get our eyes off the problem and get our eyes on the shepherd, we can find rest. That's why Isaiah wrote, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, this is another one of those verses that I learned a different way and I like the way that I learned it better than the way that this says it. It says, you will keep in perfect peace the one that is dependent upon you. Well, that's what it says, but I like the way I learned this. Thou will keep in perfect peace he whose, anybody know it? He whose mind is stayed on thee. He whose mind is focused on thee. When we focus our minds on the Lord, then we find rest. That's why Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said this, verse 28, come to me all of you who are weary and burdened and I will give you, what's the next word? Rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find, what's the next word? Rest for yourselves for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I wanna show you one thing and we'll stop today. Go with me over to Exodus 20. Exodus 20. Anybody know right off the top of your head what's in Exodus 20? Yep, the Ten Commandments. You all are biblical scholars. I heard that from all over the room. The Ten Commandments. Let me show you something. You know the Ten Commandments. You already know what they are. They start there in verse 3, and, and you can kind of glance down through it and see it. But when, it, when we're thinking about the Ten Commandments, the, the, the big ones are don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery. Those are the, you know, you, you ask somebody on the street, what are the Ten Commandments? And they'll be able to name those. But let me show you something. Glance over there in verse 13. How many words did he ta take to tell us not to kill? Three words, do not murder. How many words not to commit adultery? Four words, do not commit adultery. How many to not steal? Three words, do not steal. But just glance down through that whole chapter and which one of those commandments took the most time for him to tell us what to do? It's the fourth one. It's in verse 8. If I counted right, in my translation, there are 91 words. It took him three words to say don't kill other people. Do not kill it took him 91 words to teach us how to rest. He talks about the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath day holy because on the Sabbath day, the Lord God rested. God made us to need rest. We need cycles of rest. Every day we need a cycle of rest. That's why we go to bed at night. And I think a lot of our problems happen because we just don't get enough rest every day. And people like to talk about, you know, this great person who only needs four hours of sleep a night or five hours of sleep a night. Well, God bless them. That's wonderful. And if you can get by on that amount of sleep, that's terrific. But I read that Albert Einstein needs 11, needed 11 hours of sleep a night. I, you know, God made us to need rest. And whatever rest you need, you need and if you don't get it, you're not going to function right. You're not going to be productive. You're not going to find peace in your soul. We need that rest. Every day we need a period of rest. Every week we need a day of rest. That's one of the things I say to young pastors these days, and I didn't do this all like I should have along the way. It took me a while to be smart enough to figure out you, you, you've got it. You're, you're cheating yourself and you're cheating your family and you're... you're you're not going to be as productive if you don't learn to take that day of rest. And every season we need a period of rest, whether it's a week or whatever it is that we call it vacation. God made us that way. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. We need to learn to rest. And we get it when we put our focus on the shepherd, not on our problems. Well, that's the word for today. Um, we didn't even finish the second verse, did we? The, the, the next phrase is in the second verse, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes my life in cream. 
He leadeth me beside the still waters. That's still in verse 2, isn't it? I'm not looking. Yeah. Still, well, we'll finish verse 2 next week. And uh, we'll go from there. Let's, let's stop and pray. Father, thank you for this passage. Help us to learn to really, truly find rest in our souls. It's so easy to let the, the things of the world around us just overwhelm us. And we go to bed at night and our mind is focused on the problem. Help us to learn to focus on the solution. Help us to learn to focus on the shepherd. Help us, learn, Lord, to trust in you and to find the rest in our souls that will truly help us have peace. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.